This week we're going to start the concert with an Afro-American composer, a wonderful woman called Valérie Coleman. I got to know her during COVID time when I was still in North America. We were looking for different chamber music piece and I was um, motivated to listen some of her music and I discovered the Wind Quintet, which was unbelievable, I thought. Very engaging. And then I heard that just before COVID, she actually made an orchestra version for Yannick in um, Philadelphia. And I got the score and I liked it very much. Umoja is a Swahili word, an African dialect, meaning unity. It starts very peacefully. She's using percussion instruments, but with, with bows. So they, she does a melody which is like floating in the air, like, like a, a golden leaf or something. So there's not really a structure. Then there's a big violin solo, beautiful. And then, as soon as the percussion and the brass start to play together, she describes this being the symbols of injustices, racism, and hate. And of course, where she comes from, she's a victim of this very inappropriately present racism and hate. And she's describing this very, very well in her piece. But you still have the African feeling. It's a slow dance, always in, like one in a bar. And a lot of things are happening against different rhythms, and then it ends up again for a call of peace and unity. It's beautiful music, ideal to start a concert. This week we are going to continue our Beethoven piano concerto cycle with Tomboro, the absolutely fantastic, very young <laughs> soloist. I performed twice with him, one in America uh, with Cleveland and once here in Sao Paulo where he played uh, two years ago, I think, the piano concerto number four. He was and still is so young, I thought I would like to participate to his development because I was struck by the, his very mature musicality and his touch on the piano. His sound is very, very warm and inspiring without lacking any incisive articulation needed in the concerto sometimes. So I wanted to make something special with him. Initially, we wanted to do all the five uh, piano concertos in three weeks, but then because of our tour in the summer, then we had to transform a little bit. So um, we do the three first concertos this year with him and the two last uh, in 2025. What is interesting to work with the same soloist on the same repertoire for such a cycle, as we did with Stephen Huff, for all the Rachmaninoff uh, concertos, is that we all learn from each other. Tom came now two years after his last uh, visit to Sao Paulo. He told me, wow, the orchestra is very different there. You know, he, he noticed the work we are doing, and so he's very inspired by the orchestra. He has the maturity that I'm inspired by it. He stays simple, he's very authentic, and he goes to the essence of uh, Beethoven. He studies all the stories of the concerto in all details, but he doesn't give us lessons with words. He's inspiring us with his playing. A 
this week we move on to the second concerto. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, initially the first one written. So, uh, was written before number one, then Beethoven decided to publish number one as number one. Um, maybe because of the key, maybe because of the attitude. Um, so the, the second concerto is, is a little more, um, I guess, modest in a sense. second concerto, the cadenza of the first movement was actually written much, much later. I think, if I'm not mistaken, during the end of Beethoven's life. But in any case, one can tell the difference in the style of writing. The cadenza of the second concerto, it reminds one much more of pieces like the Hammerklavier Sonata, or maybe even, or not as wild, but some textures uh, remind me personally of the Grosse Fuga. Again, the second movement is very reminiscent of the second movement of the first concerto as well as the third concerto. The third movement actually is uh, again quite the sort of classical Beethoven rondo. It has a little gypsy feeling to it sometimes with some misplaced accents. The first theme of the third movement was written originally in a much more banal way, without those misplaced, syncopated accents, and then later on he altered it, uh, probably for the better. The concerti of Beethoven are really the perfect concertos. They're written in a splendid way. They have absolutely everything. They have room for the soloists, they have uh, interaction with the orchestra, sometimes chamber music-like interactions. One can really find everything in these pieces. That's why I think they're also such an important part of the pianist's repertoire, usually. And these are almost Bible concertos. We finish the concert with the gigantic Alpine Symphony by Richard Strauss. This is a very special piece for OSSP because they recorded it a few years ago. So there, there is a kind of um, sense of identification with the piece, which is for me very nice because I can see that first of all, they love the piece. They are looking forward not only to play, but also to have now a different conductor with different ideas. And um, we do this, it's an extension of all the work we have done on different big composers. The first I think of is our Sibelius cycle about, you know, the transparency in huge orchestra texture. This piece is not a symphony actually, it's a symphonic poem because it's very descriptive. And Strauss had hesitation to write this music. And he took in the end, to make a long story short, memories of him being 14 years old and going uh, to climb a big mountain with friends. And during the ascension, he was uh, caught by a massive storm. And they were in danger, but still they arrived to the top and then they go back. So he starts actually the hike, that's what Strauss says, at two o'clock in the morning, it's still dark, and it starts with a very somber sound, and it finishes also in the dark, because it's a very long turning, and Strauss is, is making like a big arc, 
with the end being almost exactly the same music as the beginning in, in the dark. And during this journey, we can see the Strauss as a little boy with his friends uh, arriving into the forest next to the water. In the fields, there are cows with the, with the bells of the cows, you know, making noise. And sometimes he arrives to dangerous moments with the rocks, you know, um, threatening to fall on them. So they have to hang and they fall. And so it's a lot of little adventures which you have if you go hiking in mountains. And actually, it's not supposed to be emotional because it's describing the feelings of being climbing a mountain. But it's so well written that it becomes very moving in many, many moments because of the admiration of the nature. When he arrives on the glacier, he describes the reflection of the sun on the ice. And therefore, he uses strings on a very high register and the trumpet, the utmost higher possible notes they can play. And this is representing, you know, when it's too much sun on the snow or on the ice, it's these very bright colors. And then when he's in the forest, he's very warm next to the water as well. He's describing little birds as well, with little notes here and there, almost like Ui Rapuro we played la last week. And um, when he arrives at the top, at the summit, he describes himself with the oboe playing. At the same time, the admiration of the gigantic landscape he's seeing in front of him, but also the, he's a little bit out of breath. So you can see the oboe playing. Then he starts the descent, which is much more peaceful, but the peace is coming only at the end of the peace, after the storm. The storm is very, very violent, extremely complex to put together to balance uh, the orchestra. tendency in that pieces which I've done many 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 times is that we play too loud with too much energy. What we have to do is to balance that it becomes something attractive that we want to be in the sound. If it's always loud and strong and with full energy the piece is sounding very long. So the challenge with Strauss, which is giving to us, to an orchestra, is to create this transparency all the time. Actually, Strauss wanted to call this piece the Antichrist in relation to Mahler's death a few years before, and also in relation to the Nietzsche book called uh, exactly uh, like this. But then he realized that being in the nature and admiring the nature, it could be a way not to reject Christianity, but be, to be closer. It's a drive, it's a motivation. When we are in the nature, we think that nature takes over human being, but actually, what Strauss is describing in this symphony is for us, the human being, being driven to spirituality by the nature. Mm -hmm.